Welcome to the podcast. My name is Danny Cola. If this is your first time listening, make sure to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so that you can join me in having some epic conversations that access higher levels of potential with creatives and professionals from all around the globe. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today's guest on the podcast is Kevin Canella. He's a psychedelic assisted psychotherapist. I randomly met Kevin in Austin, Texas when I was out and about one day at Zeckert Park with a couple of friends. It was a beautiful, sunny January day. And I just randomly turned to the person next to me. And of course, we start chatting up about consciousness and meditation and self-development and healing and therapy. And it turned out that Kevin was a, a trained psychedelic assisted psychotherapist and has been doing work of the sort for the last 15 years. And it was a treat to get some of his information out because I geek over consciousness all the time and ways that we could self-heal, understand reality a little bit better in our relationship with it. He had so many different types of thoughts about these topics that I decided to have a podcast with him. Here's a little bit more about Kevin. He is the executive director and co-founder of Thank You Life, a psychedelic therapy nonprofit organization with a mission of providing access to all by eliminating the financial barriers to psychedelic therapy. Kevin is a MAPS-trained psychedelic psychotherapist who has been using non-ordinary states to help himself and others heal for 15 years. His life's work has been to help people heal from their traumas and create a life full of purpose, harmony, peace, and joy. Connect with Kevin at thankyoulife.org for more information or on Instagram at Kevin on Purpose. So without further ado, here's a conversation with Kevin Canella. I hope you enjoy. You think this is... What's your question? Yeah, do you think this is... Am I close enough to the mic like this? Uh, I would say like try to get your face fist a distance away from the microphone. Cool. Uh but yeah, I think you I think you're fine. I think um let's just yeah, let's just see how it goes. All right, so Kevin Canella, what's going on? How's everything going? What's happening, Danny? Yeah, it's been a long time. Uh things are good. Just getting into this new year and um you actually just got out of a 10 day Vipassa meditation retreat a couple of days ago and just integrating with that. And, yeah, uh, that's how, that's one of the ways I kind of want to start out this conversation. You said that you were on a retreat for two weeks, right? From the 5th to the 14th. Yeah, yeah. So when I hear the word retreat, I'm like, okay, that can mean a lot of things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, break it down. What did you do? How did it go? What were some of the insights you received? Uh, mm. Yeah, just start it. And, and I'm, I'm an open book. I, I do these podcasts specifically for me because I'm super interested in stuff like this. So yeah, perfect. I want to hear about this. Yeah. And this will be an, just an interesting uh, piece of when we start talking about psychedelics. Um, you know, in, in some ways I like to say that it's a, it's a more drawn out psychedelic experience over 10 days. So I'll back up and, and explain a little bit of what this is. So these are Vipassana meditation retreats. Uh, it's this very particular kind of retreat uh, with this very particular teacher. His name's Goenka. And there are centers all over the world that do this. I think there's 60 some centers in India. There's like 15 or so centers all over the U.S. And um, then a bunch of non-center locations where there's still just people that like this and will find some sort of YMCA or something and, and, and throw one of these. They're completely donation-based, which is wild. And there's this really beautiful lineage all the way back to the Buddha. And so a lot of Buddhism has this link back to uh, Gautama, the Buddha, Um and what they talk about in this lineage is that all these different lineages are lineages preserved the words of the buddha but that the technique uh the actual meditation technique of vipassana was was not actually preserved um but they say in this lineage that they were able to uh preserve the the actual technique and so the way to get involved is to go to one of these 10 days they have some shorter ones but you need to start with a 10 day and okay. it's very intense is this, so is it uh with medicine or without because no, you say with without medicine without okay all right just making sure because you just said yeah. it was a yoga retreat or a meditation retreat rather yeah so just a meditation retreat so you know very intense schedule meditating for 10 and a half hours a day 
and literally no distractions, no music, no phones, no pen and paper, no books. The word meditation is super loaded. It's one of mm -hmm. my pillars, but I do my own version of meditation and I use it for what I think it's, you know, what it, like I use it because it helps me in, in get, getting centered. Uh, it helps me refocus myself or at least prime my brain to get myself mm -hmm. refocused, recentered. Um, I like doing it to just let my brain kind of go and I like to see where it, where it goes in a non-judgmental manner and I feel like I can have very cathartic moments much like a, a psychedelic seminar if I'm in a good state I, I feel like wow okay this is this is interesting or there's an idea that pops up that I'm just like hmm so there's a lot of ways to do it that's my point and yeah um when you're doing 10 hour meditations like what does that look like um what's the point of doing it that long right um right like so why does it even yeah. matter to do it for like that for that long let's let's unpack yeah. that a little bit yeah yeah so i'm gonna start with it just like what the technique is so the okay. the first three days is what's called anapana which is following the breath and this particular technique is following it right at the nostrils and okay. so for three days you know anapana is more a focusing technique so this is just to develop concentration Okay. And over three days, being able to more subtly uh, feel the breath, feel the, the soft breath coming in and out. Um, and so, yeah, it's just this uh, technique to develop that. Then the, you know, on day four, you learn Vipassana and the next seven days is doing Vipassana. It's essentially a body scan, um, but a body scan with this very particular orientation, which is realizing impermanence and you know there's there's we, we can like look to the outside world and see impermanence and how everything that is born whether it's a plant an animal whatever eventually dies and see how the day becomes night and the night becomes day and it's all yep. kind of endless and nothing you know it's, it's all dynamic nothing's like static and um and that's all great, but, and, and that can be a bit of an intellectual exercise, but the, the point of this meditation and the, the way that the insight of impermanence can free us is when we're really experiencing that. And the way we can really experience impermanence is through the sensations on the body and watching how each sensation that I feel arises and passes. Sometimes it, you know, some, you know, we're sitting for a lot of hours. So sometimes a lot of pain comes up and uh, that pain might stay there for some minutes, an hour, a, a long time, uh, but eventually it passes away. It's not like it's now some pain in my shoulder is eternal. I mean, I'm going to be yeah. gone in 70 years or whatever. So it's obviously the pain is eventually going to go away. Uh, so, but then other sensations, you know, arise and pass really quickly. And so it's all about being able to like, really see that, watch that in the body. And then there's this insight around it, which is, okay, if I'm not really making these sensations appear and I can't really affect them much and they're going away on their own, well, then it doesn't make sense to crave some and have aversion towards others. I can actually be in this more equanimous state just observing them. And that it really doesn't make sense to hate this pain because the the pain is going to go away. And me hating the pain isn't helping it go away. It's just creating more suffering. Yeah, for me. totally. All right. So let's let's back up. So yeah. first three days was just the nose breathing in and out. Mm -hmm. And so that was three days. You said 10 hours a day? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. Okay. And then you go from that to switching to this more of like awareness of the body and this mentality that it's perishable and mm -hmm. to uh, observe in a non-judgmental manner. So that's like the, is that the real kicker you got out of that second three day thing? Uh, well, the, the next seven days, but yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah, right. um, and yeah, they, they describe it as a technique to purify the mind. Okay. Interesting. So and there's okay. something about not reacting to the sensations because what we're typically doing is just reacting. Yes. Unconsciously. Yes. And so this is an opportunity to like do something different and 
not react and understand why it doesn't even make sense to react. And through that process, our, our reactions just kind of come up and then just like start to leave us in a particular way. And 10, you know, after 10 days of all of this, we feel just lighter and we can see how there's just less reactivity in our system. This is good. This is, uh, I mean, this, you know, people like to physically exercise because it makes their body stronger, but what you're talking about is brain exercise, legit brain exercise that really can do some wonders because we're mm -hmm. constantly reacting to our impulses mm -hmm. all the time, more than ever now with these devices that uh, distract us mm -hmm. like in crazy manners. And like, it's an addiction. It's, it could be, a, it, you know, potentially could be problematic if not, uh, you know, super problematic and addicting and like hours and hours. Like I have my version of what I am to be addicted to that thing and just like work and social media and all this stuff. It's engineered to get us to react in these ways and these impulsive ways. And I'm watching myself and I watch others and it's, I think about this a lot and it's kind of sick and it's kind of crazy. So like this mental exercise that you're doing is much, much needed on a, on a global mm -hmm. scale for mm -hmm. everybody and not just technological uh, impulses, but uh, gambling and sex and money and food and all these things that we're just like racing towards. And we don't really know why we never even step back to say, Hey, why am I reacting in this way? Why is this coming up regularly? Why is this pattern keep coming up? Okay. So great. Yeah. Let me just exercise. say something. Yeah. Go ahead. To, to that too. is like, these two words are coming to my mind at the moment, like firmness, having like a really firm mind and instable and having a really instable, weak mind. Firm and instable. I think that, you know, this like dopamine hit uh, uh, addictive thing, like you said, whether it's just with the phone or gambling or, or drugs or shopping or whatever it might be, the... Um, yeah, the addiction to that, whatever sort of dopamine hit that gives us just creates this in, instable, weak mind. And then, yeah, the, you know, the opposite of that is doing some sort of meditation like this, where, yeah, just the end result is just this firmness of mind, because for 10 days, I have not gone with the thing that says, Hey, let me grab my yeah. phone and swipe. Hey, let me go bet on a game or take myself and, 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 yeah. So it's no like phones, yeah. I'm I'm assuming, right? The whole 10 no days, phones, no phones. Yeah. Uh what about food? Um, super simple vegetarian, eating at 6 30 in the morning and eleven at for lunch and coffee at all or they have some caffeine. Um, but yeah, no, no food after noon. So it's a whole like uh you know, like 18, 19 hour um fast. what do they call it? Fast, fast. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. So, uh, prior to going to this, did you feel like this was something you wanted to do to in enhance your work, your personal self? Do you feel like there are things that you struggle with personally that made you want to do this? Talk to me a little bit about your desire to want to experience 10 days of a meditation retreat. Yeah. So one thing I'll say is I think this was number 15 for me. Hell yeah. Um, I did my first one um, I did my first few in 2010 and that was, this kind of also gets into psychedelics, uh, that 2010 was also when I first did ayahuasca. Um, and so I just had a very interesting path where, you know, I also in 2010, I was 22 years old. Um, why did you want to do it then? So it, this was like the year after graduation I graduated in December uh, from undergrad and just had this really strong pull towards spirituality. Mm -hmm. Some really like interesting mystical experiences with psychedelics in college. And then just started reading all these books and just like, couldn't get enough of it. Um, and this is and, before it's actually like really like modernized. Yeah. People weren't talking about it nearly as much as they are now in 2010. Totally. Totally. There's only a, like a couple books talking about ayahuasca. Um, so from the beginning, for me, psychedelics and this like really deep meditation kind of went hand in hand, sure. which personally was just so helpful. The The meditation just felt so grounding compared to 
you know, the psychedelics can be just so expand expanding, sure. but also kind of destabilizing in a way. Yeah. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. So you, you have an ayahuasca journey, you, you learn more. So you did 15 meditation retreats now. Um, so to, you know, to answer your question, I think back then the original reason I did it was, um, because I was having a really tough time after a bunch of this ayahuasca. And so the, like, I wasn't able to articulate it until like I was in the first meditation retreat, but I was, they had these discourses in the evening where the uh, teacher just talks for an hour about the technique and tells different stories about the times of the Buddha, all this stuff, brilliant orator. And at a certain point during the first one, my first retreat, first discourse, I was like, oh my gosh, I have a teacher now. And I didn't realize that I, how much I like craved a teacher. And I had been trying to meditate, you know, reading books and there's like this 10 minute exercise. And it's like, okay, do that for a couple of weeks. But, you know, it's hard to get something to stick to go, go sure. sit for a hundred hours and have this one particular, you know, figure who just like feels really good and like he's there. And there's just definitely like a transmission that, that is coming with what he's talking about. Um, yeah. So I, I really needed something like that to ground me and to just like help me take control of my experience and something to orient around. So it's like, yeah. okay, now if I'm, now if I'm struggling or suffering that there's a technique that I have to orient around. Okay. I can come back to my breath if I need, or I can go into a body scan instead of just closing my eyes and, and spinning. Sure. And going back to that ayahuasca experience, you said you had a hard time. So destabilizing is probably a good word. And I, I feel like I've totally. had destabilizing uh, experiences myself. So um, can we, can you try to explain what that was like in words? Because I think this is a real issue. And I've been talking about psychedelics on my podcast and not to jump around like crazy here, but I've been mm -hmm. talking around uh, on my po about psychedelics on my podcast since like 2017, super intrigued by them, just like you and how they correlate with meditation um, but I, I did have experiences where I was like, what the hell was that? I was not me. I felt like a, this crazy unity with everything. And I know that sounds like super hippy dippy to some po folks when they hear that, but like everything that you think you are, you're not every way in which you understand reality, it's completely erased almost. And you're kind of like in connection with all that there is, or at least you think that there you are. And, um, you know, my dad would tell me it's the drugs, you brain on the drugs. Right. But there's something deeper to it because I feel like a lot of people have that same kind of feeling. Um, and it's just really hard to put into words. If I can just read this quick, um, uh, it's a Bill Hicks joke that I read and I was just like, holy fuck. And he died super young. I don't know much about Bill Hicks, but I read this. And I just wanted to share this with you. Today, a young man on acid realized that all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration, that we're all one conscious, ex one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. Here's Tom with the weather. So it's a joke. Like you, you talk about something so deep like that, you lose people, but that's the kind of shit that happens. You realize that everything's atoms vibrating. You realize that death is an illusion and that's a freaky thought. And then that we're just one giant self imagining ourselves into reality, which is very hard to grasp. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that being said, how, like, what was that first uh, psychedelic or ayahuasca experience? Like, why was it destabilizing and why did you need something to ground yourself inherently to wrap around? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I definitely had some of the experiences that you were talking about in college, which were more beatific, I think is a word, like more beautiful and more pleasurable and more that like connectiveness. Mm. Um, I had some of that on ayahuasca eventually, um, but not that first year. <laughs> so the destabilizing part for me was that was really like the context of my life, which was, you know, for the previous um, five years, I was, 
at a university and really knew myself. Um, really had a, a core identity. I was in a fraternity. I was having a blast being in that fraternity, doing the whole partying thing. Um, you know, I had this role as social chair, which was like, meant like I was the one running the parties and just really, um, really like had a place there. And so, and then, you know, I had this, uh, all of these addictions to like sugar, this horrible standard American diet, shit ton of alcohol and smoking pot every day. And so between all of those things and then my friends, you know, living in this house with, there was 67 of us that could live in this fraternity house. And so I was constantly around people I felt so tight with, so connected to. Um, and I had a bit of a thought. I was like, okay, well, I feel like I've kind of got it. Like I, I'm so happy, but I'm also surrounded by all these things. Now let me go find happiness without these things. Um, and so part of the destabilization was like, okay, now there's, you know, I'm on this clean ayahuasca diet. And I think the things that I missed the most was sugar and my friends. Um, I think the alcohol and sugar was obviously very related, but, um, yeah, I had none. I, I, I literally had everything stripped from me that was, you know, that I, that I was habitualized to tasting, um, you know, getting high with friends, getting to talk and laugh and joke and just, you know, everything stripped. And so, and then, and then on top of that, the ayahuasca, which was, um, yeah, I was just going to a lot through a lot of in, intense physical and psychological overwhelm and, doing a lot of like writhing during the experiences, not really knowing what was going on, not really being able to handle it much. And then, um, so I was down in Peru and I was volunteering at this place called the temple of the way of light. And so, um, because I was volunteering, I also wasn't being held as much by like the American, um, I think one of them might've been Australian, but, uh, more like, uh, English speaking facilitators. And so there's these uh, lovely Shipipo indigenous shaman and shamanas, but they also, you know, and, and they were incredibly powerful in ceremony, but, um, you know, they, I, I couldn't go speak with them during the day and, and get, get any sort of support. Um, and, That's so crazy to me. Like these people are so connected to like the cosmic realm but then like in normal daytime without ceremony, it's just like, you can't, they're too sensitive to energy. It seems like. <laughs> what the yeah. Fuck? I mean, I don't know if I like, they barely knew Spanish. So there was like a couple, a couple link. They were like a couple languages away for me. Um, yeah. They just knew their, the Shipipa language, I believe. Um, but so that, I mean, who knows if I knew their language, if I'm sure I could have a more grounded conversation with them. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, but that wasn't available. And then the English speaking facilitators, um, you know, were also just drinking and it was like, it was their time off and it was my time off, uh, in between the retreats. And, um, yeah, so they're just what, like, I, I don't know. I just basically felt pretty alone. I was also 22 and just had everything stripped from me and going through these wild, intense experiences, it was all just very overwhelming. And so by the time, um, see, I, I was volunteering at this place. I got there in January and January, February, March did about seven ceremonies each month. And then for April, at the time that I was going to do my ceremonies, there was a Vipassana in Lima. And so I flew to Lima and did this 10 day Vipassana for the first time. And, and that's the meditation what you the meditation retreat you just yeah. did right got it yeah and so this is this is the first one that i did and so after three months of this like really intense ayahuasca i <laughs> i mean it seemed way lighter to go sit for 10 days sure uh and again and be given uh a technique so it's like okay after just like spinning out in hell for three months 
I'm still kind of spinning out in hell, but I'm at least like have a focus, have an orientation. Okay. Keep scanning the body, realize how everything's impermanent. Just having that orientation was, uh, was crucial for me at that, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably like some of the real bad rap that, you know, psychedelics can get with people who don't understand really like how it can be so therapeutic. You know, I mean, I don't know if I would have done it when I was 22. I still haven't done ayahuasca, but I've done other psychedelics, but I mm-hmm. I didn't start anything psychoactive until I was like 26. Like and I was always like super straight edge. So I can see why people would be turned off to that whole process and how like it can be damaging and you know, yeah, it could be pretty like I said destabilizing and get into psychotic episodes and the mind is very very powerful and interesting. But just like I want to conquer my body physically through exercise and sports and performance, I feel like we can conquer the mind. We can start to learn more about the mind and wrestle with it and go to those dark places and come out on the other end when you have tools like getting yourself centered around your breathing, getting yourself centered around your body, your physical form. Like when you can remember that you have these tools at your disposal when you're going through tough psychedelic times or whatever toughness that has to get like kind of drawn out or whatever stuck energy that might be kind of going through the motions in your body and in the cosmos at that time, like you have a set of tools to go to and this can be built over time, you know? Um, So yeah, very interesting stuff. And we talked like super deep right away, which I thought exactly that's how it was going to go. Just like, you don't meet a, you don't meet uh, a guy like you. I don't know. Uh, it was interesting the way we met. Should we just talk a little bit about that story real quick? Sure. Sure. Uh, so like I'm in Austin just for a few days cause I was doing a, a workshop and, um, uh, a, a like kettlebells or something, right? It was, uh, it was a landmine university workshop. So just like okay. coiling with the landmine and doing all kinds of different, like it's like a higher end sports performance movement with load, you know? Um, I've been in the industries for 15 years now, and I'm always trying to learn new modalities to just move my body, challenge my body. I just know the answer isn't heavier, faster, longer, stronger all the time. It's just not the case. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm learning about fitness. You know, it's about refining technique and understanding the intelligence of the design of the human body and now how it's integrated with the mind and how, it's working symbiotically, not just your, your body as one, but your body in relation with nature. Right. So I'm always trying to like expand my concepts and my knowledge around these topics and around longevity, human performance, and what we're capable of doing physically and now mentally. Um, but yeah, so I went to this workshop out on it, on its big ass gym. People love on it. You know, Aubrey Marcus, the, the founder of that company is a, somebody who I've learned a lot from when it comes to meditation, philosophy, psychedelics, fitness, supplements, all that stuff. So um, I'm going with a couple of friends from that workshop to, I think it's Ackerman Park, not Ackerman Park. What's the name of that park? Oh, Zilker. Zilker Park. Zilker Park. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. And there was all these people. It was the end of January. It was so hot and like people rollerblading, people running around, having picnics, the dogs. It was a wonderful sight for someone like me from the Midwest. End of January, Chicago is like super gloomy and dark and cold. And it was just super refreshing, right? And then you meet all these people that are just kind of like dancing and (laughs) moving around and just doing whatever humans do. And I don't even know why you were there, but we just start chatting. And it's not like you're the first person I randomly talk to about meditation and psychedelics. Like almost always this type of conversation ends up happening when I'm talking to somebody. So it's just so random that you're a psychedelic assisted psychotherapist right there. And it's just like, Oh cow, let's let me pick your brain as much as I possibly can. Um, So yeah, like we just were there at, at Zilker park chatting. We had been talking there for like 90 minutes at least about, you know, all this stuff, meditation, psychedelics, the brain. And then we you know we haven't really touched much on trauma and development of a baby and what's happening from zero to seven and how mm. all that entanglement can be causing some of the distress and disease that we're seeing as people kind of get older. Um, so, yeah, man, yeah. it was cool. And you don't you don't necessarily meet people like you all the time. So it was a real pleasure. And I've, I've had you in my head this whole year. And I was like, I got to talk to this kid again on my podcast. 
Thank you. you know? Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I I remember little bits of what we talked about. I just remember going on a lot of tangents about trauma healing and, and yes. trying to do my best to articulate how how it actually works. And I'm sure I told you about attachment and the nervous system and all kinds of things. Yeah, you definitely did. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's elaborate. Let's elaborate more on this. So, um, just to kind of recap the retreat. 10 days, three, just the, three through the nose, three days, three intense days of focusing on nose breathing. And then f- four intense days of just seven. T- se- oh, seven after that. Right. So yeah. 10, yeah, full 10. Right. Yeah. So seven days meditating on the body, awareness of the body and the fact that it's perishable and temporary. Thoughts are temporary. It comes, it passes, it goes through, it passes, it goes through, it passes. And this method is very good from detaching yourself from this constant need for being stimulated right is that basically the end the end of it and it's a very powerful tool to have it's not just oh yeah we meditated in caves for 10 days or whatever the hell it was um it's this tool now that you could take with you and it's very it's a very interesting superpower wouldn't you say 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean it has been, yeah. Yeah, and and somebody that's been in the fitness field for a long time, looking for new ways to get people healthier, you know, like I said, it's not just faster, more weights, more reps, working out longer, longer cardio, starving yourself. It's not just this anymore. It's where do we have stuck energy? Why do we have stuck energy? Where does it sit in the body? How is it affecting our organs? How is it affecting our fascia? Are there physical techniques, more physical te- techniques that we can do to... um just, I guess, free up some of that stuck trauma, traumatic energy. Uh, And at the end of the day, trauma is what's stopping us from healing fully. It's unsettled trauma, unconscious pieces of, I guess, I like to use it macro or micro trauma, that myth of normal, uh, that Gaber Mate book, that just Mm -hmm. new one, uh, they were talking about big T trauma, little T trauma. I've been calling it micro and macro trauma for years before I even read it in the book. So I guess this is a big part of what's kind of playing out over time in your body when it comes to sickness, depression, physical ailments, mental issues, emotional issues, all kinds of disease. Let's talk a little bit about that and where where else we can yeah. go with this. <laughs> I, and I got a question for you with this. Sure, sure. I'm curious. So I don't want to say this. I'm curious what you see working with people more, you know, in the body and in like the workout arena Mm -hmm. with like on one hand, their own limitations because of how trauma is stuck in their body. And then also how, even just what you're doing, even though it might be focused on the physical, how it can help people work through shit. Cause I, I just know for myself how much, um, working out has helped me work through a lot mentally. Yeah. I mean, it's different for everybody. You know, there's infinite amount of things that can play out with somebody. And like, we can't know everything, like can't know everything that they're eating. We can't know everything that they're doing outside of our workout session, you know, so I have limited information. Uh, But what I do see is that when people are regularly exercising, like mood is enhanced tremendously, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Their energy levels are different than if they weren't working, if they weren't working out, you know? So these are the first two. And then I even see this in myself, right? Like at the end of the day, it's not that I stop looking for physical changes because I really like the fact that I look physically strong and muscular Mm -hmm. and all that. And I think those are great uh, attributes to have. And I think everyone should have that if that they want, if they want that. But I think regular movement of the body And I think not just regular movement in in any willy nilly shape. I really find that these circular and twisty motions are helping a little bit more, at least for myself and for the, the, you know, the 30 people that I train on a weekly basis, maybe 50 people. I don't know. Um, I've noticed that it does help them physically. It helps them with their mobility. It helps them have, uh, you know, more range in their shoulders, their spine, their head, their neck, their joints specifically, because we know that joints are like their own mini chakras, like if there's any sort of distortion in joints, then you're not getting clear messages that are coming through. Mm. Makes sense. Mm. So like, this is what I've kind of uncovered 
over my 15, 16 years in the industry as a fitness coach and teacher. Um, yeah. And I just want to learn more and more about this stuff. I do see like a lot of joint issues, right? Like elbow, hip, knee, lower back. Um, you know, and then I start thinking about like gut issues. Like th these are, this is, this is a piece of information that's hard for me to kind of just understand based on just talking with them. Like I, I would have to learn how to read and interpret blood charts or different types of scans, you know, like I don't know on a deeper level other than what I just kind of see on the surface. But I do know that if you're exercising regularly, you just have a, you know, a clear mind, a, a better mood, you have more energy, you feel like you're capable of doing all kinds of physical activity. And life is a physical task. I mean, I'd like to think life is one giant farmer carry, you know, it's just like you're constantly Love rotating that. and moving and picking up shit and walking it to your car and moving things from up and down your house and out in your yard and all that. Like, it's just like you have to be mobile to do things. Like if you're moving and you have a business, like, I don't know how people out of shape do it. Or if you're in pain, how the fuck do you do it? Excuse my language. But it's like you have to be physically strong. And I really, really think that making rotation part of your everyday Workout tasks helps strengthen your fascia. And I think at the end of the day, the fascia is the intelligent mm. fabric that mm. stores all our trauma, 100%. And like that's tied into your organs. Certain fascial lines drive into certain organs. And we know certain emotions get stuck in certain parts of the body. So like, you know, frustration and anger gets stored in the liver and the gallbladder or like how... I don't know exactly where which emotion is which organ but i do mm -hmm. know that the fascia connects to the organs the organs connect to the fascia and it, it's co constantly communicating back and forth with the brain and throughout every single cell in your body and i do feel like by doing regular rotational exercises in your day-to-day -day, with load without load it helps free up that stuck energy and who knows how impactful on certain people it can be versus others but I know for me and what I've seen in my gym, it's a positive thing. Uh, and yeah, people take it with that, you know, people take that information into account as they do on their own level because it's, it's kind of complex. Totally. Yeah, I had a couple of thoughts about that. And yeah, specifically like with the rotation stuff and just I imagine that opening up the body for people. And yeah, you talking about the fascia. I just think of this phrase I, I don't know like a ton about this kind of stuff but i do find how important somatic based therapy is and and mm. just one of the main aspects of psychedelic work is is how somatic it, it it can be at least but um yeah this idea of like character armor um and like our posture and these um you know when i think of character armor it's like kind of just like how our fascia has coalesced or got um got stuck in a particular way yes uh, yes to... specifically from just like being in these rounded postures and looking at your phone and then just kind of your breathing also has a lot to do with it too a lot of folks just mm -hmm. like breathe through their mouths high and tight and it's just that compresses the fascia all throughout the entire body mm -hmm. and you're in this like chronic fight or flight state that's the one thing about human beings right like we put ourselves in this fight or flight because oh we feel danger in whatever way we're thinking about this way of destruction in our head doom and gloom whatever the things that we like to think about that put us in this negative funk like normal like other animals that get into a fight or flight state like there's another predator or somebody that's in their area they run they get out and then they quickly come back to this parasympathetic regulated. state right yeah. a regulated yeah. you know equilibrium for human beings like depending on this, those traumas and our prior patterns we don't we may not go back into that uh rest and digest state as easily and in fact we have to reteach ourselves to do that and unfortunately, some folks are in that chronic fight or flight and they think that's normal. Right? Yeah. yeah. And like that to me says, aha, that's why lifespans are shorter in some degree. That's why people are getting cancer earlier. That's why people are having all kinds of 
issues when it comes to their brain or their blood or different physical ailments, autoimmune issues, like some th hundreds of autoimmune issues out there. And it's like, is there an answer? Maybe there's not one particular drug, but is that also correlated with suppressed emotion? Is that correlated with generational trauma that just keeps on going through this cycle? You know, it, it where, where does it stop? How does it stop? Where does somebody like tell, where does a doctor have the balls to tell somebody like that? Hey, this is what's kind of stopping you. You're going to have to untangle some of this anger and frustration that's been coming down from your grandparents through your mom, through you now. You know, like I think there's still like a schism medically between like pure medical stuff, like an autoimmune disorder. And that's what I, I imagine a lot of this you're getting from Gabor Mate's new book. And yeah, the, the, I don't know, the psychological piece of it. Yeah. Imagine if a doctor could link those two and really bring those two together and, and say something like that. Part of it say, though, Kevin, wouldn't you agree is like teaching people that this is potential. This is a possibility and having the belief that this is a thing you know what i'm 100%. saying and not and not just like oh this is like a physical thing that i that the psychological piece has no relevance to yeah so let's talk about what you've seen in your like in your practice in your day-to-day -day working with people is it, it's always ketamine assisted psychotherapy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's what you've basically have experienced with yeah, and um, yeah, and so I have some personal experience, uh, like as the um, as the client, and then also um, as the facilitator, which as, is super as important. Totally, you know, totally. we're all like that's another metaphor for like we're students in the game of life, and as we gain knowledge, we become teachers, but we're never like. We never know everything. We're always, we always have to be students. So like we're students and teachers, you know, I'm being trained at the same time I'm a trainer. And I think it's super important that therapists are going through their th own therapy. You know, I'm a fitness instructor going through my own version of fitness. And I'm looking at fitness from so many different angles because fitness is lifestyle design. Fitness is more than just your exercise routine, right? It's God, it's, it's so complex. Humans are so complex, but there's, and there's never just one thing that's the cause of something. It's usually like a culmination and things kind of compound over time. So you have experience as the client, you have experience as the therapist. Let's talk, let's talk about mm -hmm. it. Why is, why is this even coming up today as a solution? And why is it going to be a huge part of our, I don't know what you want to call this era, this COVID era, right? But there is a lot of trauma that's happened through this whole time, whether it's, you know, mass COVID lockdown related or losing your job or losing loved ones, not being able to communicate effectively, tearing families apart, this divisiveness, digital time, this weird space, space that we're in. There's going to become a time where we're going to have a lot of sick people and it's probably fairly soon. I mean, we do have a lot of sick people, but people are going to be coming to people like you for the answers or help with this untanglement, this mind virus that we're content, we're, we're finding ourselves in. And then through technology, like so the social media platforms, like it's manipulating us. We don't know it, but it is. So how do we untangle that? And why is this going to be the way of the future? Simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Super simple. And I don't mean it. I'm sorry. It just, <laughs> no, blah, blah, blah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> Tell me the answer. I want to know the answer. You have it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I like that you're talking about like the, the like micro and macro, the, and the individual healing and how the individual healing, um, collectively all the individual healing makes up the global healing right. or, or not, um, or sickness. Um, and yeah, I think what, you know, like, psychedelic therapy and just psychedelics in general and all of these healing paths, whether, you know, someone doesn't do any psychedelics and loves the Vipassana or, you know, there's, there's many paths besides just those two, even, 
Um, I, I think the important thing is that people just are on their own path and that there's like a, I mean, something I think is still relatively rare is that there's a desire to seek. Um, there is. And I think part of that can, you know, be a desire to seek, you know, more grand truths about reality. Mm. Um, but another desire to seek is to like really alleviate my own suffering and to understand more about how I get myself into the situations that I get myself into, how I create the life that I create. And um, yeah, how am I, where's my role in my own suffering? Um, Which is yeah, a very there's... hard question, right? Totally, totally. And, and even harder when you come to those realizations, like, oh shit, I'm the culprit of this. And I have been this whole time. What the fuck? <laughs> totally, totally. Um. So yeah, I I think that's what is important is that there's avenues for people to find something that works for them. Now, what hasn't been happening is that this avenue of psychedelics is available um, and set up well. Uh, I mean, I guess it's it's been available in an underground manner, most of which has been recreational. There's been you know a tiny bit of underground therapy, you know, work happening therapeutically, um, or ceremonially, but most of the underground is, you know, taking MDMA at raves and tripping with friends and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And um, that was, that, that was me. And I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> like, I just, it's like, I, if you, if I'm, I'm seeking certain healing for myself, I'm seeking higher levels of creativity. I'm on, I want to learn more about how reality works. I want to learn more about consciousness and, you know, another way of learning how, of saying how reality works or learning about reality is we're searching for God or the concept of God. Totally. Right. We're Right. And I think we're all trying to figure that out in some way, shape or form. So yeah, it's, it's super interesting, man. Super interesting. Yeah. And, you know, part of your question is like, why now? Um, I think there's just like some historical reasons for that. And to be honest, like, I just want to give a lot of credit to Rick Doblin. Um, oh, dude, that guy's a fighter. Holy cow. Yeah. I mean, he, he perhaps may have single handedly like s saved all of this. And um, yeah, you know, he's been, and if for people unfamiliar, he's the executive direct, or director of MAPS, uh, the multi Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And he created it in the mid to late 80s, right as I was being born. Um, I think they started in 86, 87. I was born in 87. Nice. And um, this was right as MDMA um, was put as a Schedule One drug on the, uh, you know, the Controlled Substances Act. Um, and since then, he's been doing research to try to prove its efficacy, that there's actually medical value in specifically with, uh, you know, uh, like psychological value. Yeah. PTSD, so, specifically depression. Yeah. Um, you know, did you know, do you know if it passed the phase three trials? I know that's like recently or coming up or it, it just happened. Yes. So they, um, they just came out with a press release recently about their second phase three trials. So they did one and there was a nature article on the results of their first phase three trial. I think a couple of years ago, might've been 2018, 2019, even, um, I'm not sure what the results of the second one were. I briefly saw the press release, I think this morning, and it says something like that the, um, that the results were the results of the first one were affirmed with the results of the second one. So I imagine something similar. The biggest takeaway with the results of the first one is that 67%, two thirds of the people. So these are all people with uh, treatment resistant PTSD who get uh, three MDMA sessions. And then, you know, they, they take measurements for, their score in these 
PTSD tests. Um, and, you know, they do them kind of throughout and then um, like three months, six months, a year afterwards. And a year after these people went through, 67% of them, two thirds of them, no longer had PTSD. Um, it's hard to call it like a cure, but, and, and you know, it could always come back. But um, what was also amazing is that their scores were trending up. And so people from three months to a year were getting better. So awesome. it's, uh, it's kind of the, you know, it really flips what we typically think of as medicine on, on, on its head where it's like, um, Oh, like this thing was really, you know, I put this thing in my body and it really helped. And then, you know, the next day it doesn't help as much. And the next day it doesn't help as much, whether, you know, any kind of supplement or vitamin or, right. or whatever. But this is like, oh, I put this thing in my body and it created an experience that allowed me to heal. And then that catalyzed my life in a way where I was continuing to heal. And then a year later was actually even better than I was just like three months after. There's also something with psychedelics where it can really like shake our life up. And so, um, you know, so what is that? Is that is that like re that is that the rewiring of neural pathways happening in real time? Like I love Tim Ferriss and Peter Atia's analogy of like, um, just like uh, let's think of ski skiers on a, on a a mountain going down, mm -hmm. and they're, they're creating those grooves with the skis, and then people just kind of follow those same grooves. What uh, doing a psychedelic is like the the analogy would be to have that same mountain that has all those grooves. And that analogy is basically our brain, our way of our normal constructed our patterns. Networks. Yeah, our neural networks and our normal patterns day, day after day. And some of them are destructive. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad, whatever. But we get this fresh new powder mm -hmm. over that mountain. Wait, we get this fresh new look of things without those same macro or micro trauma grooves that are there. So... um yeah, like what is that? What what is that fresh new thing? What is that shake up? And and why is it so profound and good? Yeah, good question. Um hmm. so yeah. Let's just start with like neural networks. Um, you know, I and I have a little bit of a background in this. And what I'm going to say here is really just my best guess at what I've seen sure. from my own, like my own like inner work and then my own clinical work. Yeah, um, you're not a neuroscientist. I don't expect you to know all that stuff. But then there's like neuroscientists that want to talk about all this stuff that don't have the clinical understanding and experience that happens right you listen to andrew huberman i love him he's super smart but he's doing everything in a lab he's not with right, people you know right. and then there's a guy like jordan peterson who's been talking to people for 30 years 35 years who gets slammed like hell whether you agree with some of his thoughts or not but like he's got 30 years plus years of like clinical research like actually interacting with these people and paying attention to patterns we're human pattern detecting machines Right. We see all these things we're like, ah, shit, this is good. This is bad or coherent or incoherent patterns. I don't like to use words good or bad anymore. I'm sorry about that. But like coherent yeah. and incoherent. But anyway, let's talk with neural networks. Give me your. Yeah. So one thing I think of, and this comes from uh, something called sensory motor psychotherapy. We talk about uh, the idea of um, these uh, what's called procedural learning. So, you know, like riding a bike is a form of procedural learning, but also right. just knowing how to um, see someone on the street that you know, and you walk up to them a certain way, you shake their hand, you know what words to say for a greeting. Mm -hmm. All that's just this encoded procedural learning. Um, you can almost think of that as a particular neural network or these particular grooves, right? It's like, mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm at the top of the ski mountain. And what is life calling for? Should I go down the groove of riding a bike or should I go down the groove of saying hi to my friend in the street? <laughs> and, you know, one groove is going to have me, you know, sit and, you know, 
whatever you you, you get it i get so it. <laughs> um so that's procedural learning and and you know we can almost think of these different neural networks that have this these different modes of procedural learning so we start to think about i was gonna say trauma and really whether it we have trauma or not, we have these grooves of how we live. Um, we have these grooves of how we react to getting, uh, not yes. getting our way or yes. something happening that we don't want to happen in life. And that's, I, I would call that exactly a micro trauma or a little, little T trauma. This happens with everybody. We all have it. I don't care who you are, how healthy you are. Something like that will pull and push you and give you a mm -hmm. sense of hormonal release or imbalance that make you react as opposed to respond if you're not using those tools to whatever okay you get what i'm saying yeah yeah all right and um yeah you know whether we get rejected dating or all these different yes. things right yes and yeah but then we have these uh you know networks of how of how to deal with that and then okay so how did those networks get there um then you i I think you're really getting into um, early childhood experiences and attachment and um, how we learned to deal with emotions. And so, you know, we learned how to deal with emotions by watching our parents, our caregivers. Um, and, you know, we watch how mommy or daddy responds to anger and then we internalize that. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, they have a big outburst, so I'll have a big outburst. Or, um, oh, they they get really cold and quiet, so that's how you deal with anger. Or this is how you deal with sadness. You don't talk about it. And we do um, this unconsciously. We pay attention yeah. to patterns of mom and dad. This is happening zero to seven, and this is basically ingrained, and it becomes personality. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and so. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we find ourselves say at 25, 30, 35, we're getting interested in doing some psychedelic work. And we have all these grooves that are already pretty laid out. We have a certain way of dealing with sadness, with anger, with uh, not getting what we want, with getting what we don't want, all these different things. Um, so then what happens with psychedelics? So, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it opens the doors of perception, we say. I think which is what's interesting is like, the, you, you know, we, ha we have some knowledge of the brain through neuroscience and it's still just like a lot of metaphor and analogy to, sure, to try sure. to articulate what the fuck is happening. Yeah. You know, with some things we actually have like a, a, a mechanism for other things. It's like, we know the mechanism, but it's, it's pretty abstract to say the doors of perception are opened. Yet we, um, you know, I, I don't know how accurate these numbers are going to be, but I, I've heard things like, you know, billions of bits of information are coming into our brain every moment. And only a certain percent of those are coming into our awareness. Now with psychedelics, that percent increases mm. and all of a sudden we're just flooded with awareness of a greater amount of the information that's always coming in through to us yes yes okay very good i like this uh, um, can, I pa can we just pause yeah. right there too yeah, yeah so like i did a, a podcast with a fella who teaches fascial maneuvers and this is all like mm -hmm. the twisting and turning of the the body from a fascial standpoint doing breathing exercises and pulling and pulling and torquing and torquing um and he says that when you're doing this regularly that your sensory inputs are really heightened as well. So like mm. we're seeing colors from a higher level. We're uh, tasting things to a greater degree. We can, sm our smell is increased. Our skin grows more like a baby. The hair grows longer. The nails grow longer or stronger. So like <clears throat> his claim by specifically doing these fascial maneuvers over extended period of time, day after day, that, we can start having some of these uh, higher understandings of that input that's coming in. That's always coming in, but we can't technically tap into without the work to become more adapted to taking that in, right? Whether that's in physical matter, 
or the electrical impulses coming through us in forms of ideas or thoughts or behaviors or creations. Check, Kevin. Now you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Going back to the psychedelics, they open you up. It's always coming in, but we have a greater understanding to receive that information in. And that's very eye-opening. It's like, oh. Yeah, and so that I think that's just one way to look at it. And then, you know, um, there's such a great visual representation in Michael Pollan's book of the amount of neural connections happening in the brain baseline versus on psilocybin. And they draw it as two circles. And um, basically the first circle has a bunch of sparse lines uh, indicating connectivity. And then, and that's the baseline. And then you see this, uh, and I, I, I don't know what you would Google, but I imagine you could find this on Google if you Google something about um neuro, neural connected neural connectivity on psychedelics on psilocybin something like this um the second circle is just tremendously filled with all this connectivity i mean just you know two three four hundred percent more connectivity i'm not sure what it you know what the actual numbers are but it's the the visual of it is uh just so so telling we'll, we'll clip and, this out and we'll put the visual in great great we'll try <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah and it's in it's in how to change your mind uh by michael pollan so okay so now we have these two things that first thing that i said about um we're we're more aware of more bits of information neural connectivity is like way increased and i think all of this is um is why the analogy works of there being more like fresh powder on what once was really um, dialed in grooves. Got it. And so if you imagine that first image, um, the baseline image where there's not a lot of connectivity, perhaps you could say that the only connectivity there is like the, the well-worn grooves. Then all of a sudden you take psilocybin and, you know, 45 minutes, an hour later, you have all this connectivity going on. Well, okay, now I have more options. I don't need to just take the well-worn grooves. I can take any direction, which is, that's the analogy of, oh, now there's fresh powder. And so there isn't a groove. I can right. actually just manipulate anywhere. Yeah. Um. So that's a bit of that. And then why that is powerful Um. I think that is just such a good setting the stage for healing to happen. Can you and, talk to me about uh, an experience you had when you started feeling that higher level of neural connectivity where your perspective starts to enhance and change? I like to also think of this as like different octaves in music chords are made up of different notes that really work well together and it's a, you can do this with a lot of different notes in a lot of different ways and it's like it's a more enhanced version of the one note on one chord right versus four of them on a guitar fretboard strumming along all these different notes in one pattern boom it's the same note but just a different version of it so can you explain yeah. to me one of your experiences as uh, somebody who's gone through the work um can you explain it with emotions or like a certain uh, scenario that went through your head where you had this catharsis yeah so great question yes and let me speak a little bit more about um the i guess the healing piece of yeah yeah go and, ahead sorry and then how then I'll, I'll let the story, the personal story, really display the cool. s some aspects of the healing as best cool. as I can. Cool. Um. So, yeah, being on a psychedelic and having you know the analogy of fresh powder on your mind, um, where there's just more possibilities and it's easier to not take the well-worn groove, means something different can happen and. 
one way I think we could describe healing and trauma healing um, is that there's these missing experiences. And what we're often looking for, often the way this goes is we're, we're looking for a core memory from which, um, you know, these beliefs about oneself were born and these very particular habit patterns were born. Um, and so well, to start to get into the story, for me, what this core memory that came up was, was I was four years old and I was in timeout. And I really wanted my mother uh, because I was very overwhelmed in my system and very dysregulated. Um, and, you know, what we know about kids is, and, and just attachment and the nervous system, we really need our cortex online to be able to regulate our nervous system. And the way I, what I think is going on is that our cortex is what is the part of us that helps us tell ourselves how we're safe. So it's the part where there's language and narrative and we're able to tell ourselves how and why we're safe. So the difference between me and a four-year-old or an infant going to bed at night is going to bed, say alone, I'm able to say to myself, I'm in this neighborhood, I'm in this house, and my doors are locked, and I've been here a long time. I, there's not a lot of, you know, crime around. Right. So I, I feel safe. I'm able to hold all of that context in my mind. A four-year-old, the main context that they'll hold is more like, uh, I'm in my room, but mommy and daddy are gone. An infant can't even conceptualize any of that. So, you know, I'm sure a four-year-old could be in their house by themselves for some amount of time, but eventually they're not going to have enough there to keep their right. system regulated. So this is where attachment comes in. What attachment is, is the child literally borrowing the nervous system of the adult to help them regulate. Mm. So what I was wanting in this moment of being really upset and dysregulated um, was mommy. I wanted her, I needed her nervous system to help me feel okay. My supervisor will always say something that, um, that a lot of this stuff that we have to work on is often comes from uh, moments of big emotion in childhood when there was no one there to help us move through it. And so this is one of those moments for me. Um, so I was talking about core memories. Um, so that was one of my core memories that came up and that you, did you have that aha moment? on a psychedelic experience where that memory did come up and you were like, holy shit, I didn't have mom's nervous system at that exact time when I needed it. So in that regard, I'm feeling this abandonment in other areas in my life today at 30, 25 or whatever it was. Does that, does that happen? Is that safe to say that? So yeah, I'll give a little more context that, that image, that memory originally came up years ago. And I'd been, I'd been working on it. And basically, um, it was so distressful that I ultimately shut down. So to give a little bit of context about the nervous system, there's these three general states of the nervous system. Um, I know you're talking about rest and digest. This is yeah. what's called polyvagal theory. Slight update of um, the rest and digest model. Let's do it. Give me a so polyvagal yeah. theory. So like vagal nerve. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. Which basically has two aspects to it. And what they talk about now is that there's actually two aspects of the parasympathetic nervous system. One is this like shutdown that we go into, which is like preparing for death. And one is this more regulated where we're just really available. Um, so I would say, 
Yeah, so it's just kind of split into two. So there's th- so there's these shut three, down, prepare yeah. for death, and then regulated more re- like available to meet life. Got yeah, it. yeah. And then of course the third is the more uh, fight flight sympathetic response. Got it. Um. So yeah, you know we can we can look at our experience in this very general way and say, okay, am I feeling good and grounded? And I'm really ready to meet life more in a flow state, perhaps that's regulated. Or am I more, um, you know, have some excessive motor activity going on, slight increased heart rate, a little bit of anxiety or irritability going on. Okay. I'm more in that um, fight flight sort of space, or am I more lethargic, depressed, um, and, and, and that's the more shutdown space. So when I was really upset at first being alone as that four-year-old, I was very much in that fight flight. Um, and ideally a parent would come and I would be able to regulate through that fight flight and come back to regulation. But because that didn't happen, uh, and because I was four and didn't have enough of my own cortex online to fucking breathe through that shit. <laughs> Um, I, the only real option left for me to do was to shut down. So what begins to get built out in me as this procedural memory is that when is like, oh, this is how I deal with, um, a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress in my body. I shut down. Um, and part of that learning in there too, is I feel a lot of stress in my body and reaching out is not available. And so because right. reaching, give me, yeah. give me a pause. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, they've been good this whole time. All right. All right. Easy. Hey, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Guys. It's okay. It's okay. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Quiet. It's okay. It's fine. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Okay. I'm going to edit this. Don't worry. Okay. So, your way of dealing with this, guys. (laughs) It's what we're talking about. They want to borrow your nervous system to calm down. They definitely do. They definitely do. (laughs) Um, So this is how you deal with it. You shut down. And what does that mean? Does that mean like you lose consciousness or you just like don't talk to anybody? You just go directly internal and then you start telling yourself that you're bad. Nobody wants you. Nobody need. Nobody wants to take care of you. Yeah. Stuff like that. Uh, It can it can look like all that dissociation. Yeah. Depression. Um, And. In in this way, it's like we're. we're like freezing what's in our nervous system, uh, numbing ourselves to it. Mm. So if I regulate through something, I actually like go through that, uh, that fight flight energy and, and have it run through my system. And I calm back down ah. When I shut down. It doesn't run through my system. I more just numb myself to it as best I can, but it's still locked up in my system. Ah. And so now it's like, this layered thing, instead of me just being more clear in my system, there is a stress response that got kind of coalesced. And so then the process, the process of undoing that is first, it needs to thaw out and we need to like, but then, you know, we, we don't go from shutdown back to regulation. We go from shutdown back to whatever got thawed out, which for me was that being upset, being very overwhelmed with a lot of stress in my system. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, it's like a lot of ways that P- PTSD, this PTSD work with ketamine and, and other things looks for veterans is like, you know, a lot of like shaking it out and what they're shaking out um, f- yeah, again, first, all of that needs to fall. And then once it all falls, 
it's this sympathetic fight flight response that needs to like get shaken out of the body that they had from war or what you know whatever they were going yeah through. um so okay so i had that image going on and then i did this uh series with my therapist um and during the first one this image came up it was an image I was familiar with. Um, and just to give like a bit of an idea of how it all worked. And so at first, you know, I, I took the medicine and it was coming on for a little while. I was beginning to like feel a little uncomfortable in my body. Wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, and then at a certain point, um, you, you know, this is me just like lying on the floor and my therapist sitting next to me. And, you know, she, she was just encouraging me to associate to my experience, be with my experience, notice what, what is happening, notice what I want, what wants to happen. Um, and so the, the first thing that arose was me being shut down and feeling alone. And at first I didn't even notice that that's what I was experiencing. I just noticed, oh, I'm uncomfortable in my body. Just like, I don't like being here. I don't know what's happening with this medicine. It's kind of coming on, but I don't, I'm not really feeling it. Mm -hmm. I've been there before. I know what that feels like. So what that was a perfect, um, what do you call it? Like re, uh, reenactment of was that shut down and feeling, feeling alone and not being able to reach out. Mm. And so what gets to happen in these, you know, in just therapy in general, but even more specifically uh, in psychedelic work is that, yeah, there gets to be a, a recapitulation of the old memory, but something new gets to happen. And the therapist and my own adult self gets both get to play the role of parent and I get to reparent this part. And this young part of me gets to have the parent that it always wanted to have back then. And so again, the first piece that comes up for me is feeling really shut down alone, not allowed to reach um, just kind of like feeling uncomfortable. I'm not even thinking like that. I'm not allowed to reach. I'm just like, Oh, I'm alone. And this sucks. And this is very uncomfortable. I'm kind of like writhing around a, a little bit feeling kind of confused. Uh, and then something, um, she does something. My therapist does something that allows me to reach out towards her. And then that's the that's the first sort of shift in all of this. Then I'm still shut down, but wow, this is already a new experience because like a parent came while I was shut down, not used to this happening. So you're so, reconstructing this as in real time, basically. Yeah. Crazy. Um yeah, and again, like I didn't have I wasn't able to like tell myself this story at this point towards the end of this session. And as I integrated in the coming days, I was able to piece this together. Um, there was definitely a moment where I was like, Oh, uh, I'm eight. Like, yeah. So I'll, I'll get to that. But okay. at this point, I'm just like, Oh, okay. I'm like able to reach out for her. That helps a little bit, but I'm still kind of shut down. And at this point, the the key with all this i think the big through line with all of this is associating to our experience associating to our experience and how do we do that essentially mindfulness noticing our thoughts noticing our body sensations noticing our feelings and just continuing to do all that continuing to associate to our experience and so there was definitely a shift now that uh, i was able to reach out to her um, you need I'm a pause sorry. again? Yeah, yeah, give me one second. I'm so sorry. There's like these woman walking dogs right across the street from my house. And you can just see, she just likes to stop right there. I don't know how far you can see. 
yeah, yeah. She yeah. just stops, and then my boy was just like, "Get off my lawn!" <laughs> and it's, she, they're not even. Uh, they're just the lady stopping to take a. The, she's not pooing, but her dog is pooing. <laughs> and you're getting into the juiciness of the story. Ah. Rico, take it easy. Let's take it from where you're she's there reaching out and you get to talk to her, but that only helps a little. Yeah. Start. And I wouldn't even say, yeah. So yeah, at a certain point I'm able to reach out to her. Um, she probably initiated it. I'm not totally sure. And I, I mostly mean like physically reach out. Um, so there's different levels, but there, there can be a decent amount of touch involved. And obviously yeah. that's a thing that really needs to be, um, yeah. carefully constructed. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I had a good relationship with her and we both felt comfortable. And so the, uh, there was a good bit of touch. And so I think at first it was just like, um, getting to like hold her hand some. And so this is the first um, kind of like healing moment of the reenactment. I'm not alone in my shutdown. Um, the the parental figure is now there. The attachment figure is now there. And even though what I'm experiencing is kind of shitty, at least I'm not as alone. Yeah. Um. So now in this space, I'm kind of going through my thawing process. It might've lasted 20, 30, 40 minutes where it's just that uncomfortable, but because she's there and I'm not feeling so stuck like I used to, it's, it's all beginning to get to fall some. And eventually she just kept encouraging me to express myself somatically in my body. And what it turned into was me like really essentially getting to have a temper tantrum hmm. that that four that that distressed four-year-old wanted to have so i kept talking about how dysregulated and overwhelmed and stressed that four-year-old was if he could have chose anything to happen it would have been for his mother to hold him why he just got to like shake shake out and essentially have a temper tantrum and just like scream and move how he needed to move to just move that energy out of his body. That's what he really wanted. But he wasn't able to do that himself. He didn't have the foresight to be like, you know what I need? I need to just shake this shit out. <laughs> he couldn't do that himself. He really needed the mother there to facilitate sure. that, to encourage him to move how he needed to. So slowly that was able to happen with my therapist. And, you know, now at this point, I'm like basically like in her lap, holding on to her and just like kind of writhing it out and she's just loving me and supporting me and encouraging me very important encouraging me to express mm. encouraging me to express whatever's there which again isn't a lot of words some sounds some moaning some like you know feet stomping some writhing in my body that's what this looks like so this is like the second piece of the, um, you know, like something new getting to happen, which is, um, you know, at first somebody showed up while I was shut down. Now I'm not shut down anymore. Now I'm more in that sympathetic fight flight space and wanting to be regulated through the stress, that mm -hmm. stress, that fight flight stress. And, and she's doing that and how I wanted someone to show up for me in that again, was to hold me, encourage me, and really walk me through that. Um, where what I was used to was expressing and and being told no and to stop. And that's ultimately why I was put in timeout to begin with, because I was stressed out, but expressed it. And so I guess that's a part that I kind of missed uh, articulating here is that's also something that I learned from that experience was I'm not allowed to express mm. the stress that I feel when I, when I express the stress that I feel I'm put in timeout because I might hit my sister or, you know, 
like I, I have no tact in, in expressing it or I'm just making a scene or whatever. And I'm told no bad by my parents or sent to timeout. And this whole construction forms of how, oh, and this is me learning. Oh, this is how I deal with stress. This is how I deal with that stress and overwhelm. Not allowed to express. So I shut down. And so now this is all healing. I'm getting a new blueprint, a new model of what's okay. I'm getting a new, um, yeah, like a new path to walk down. Yeah. I think you should express it pretty good. A new model, a new blueprint to express it. Like the, it sounds like, and this is what I've been saying too. It's like psychedelics, meditation, all these things could be uh, used to recognize the trauma learn to neutralize it and then reform a new way of thinking and you can move on from that and this is what healing is recognizing neutralizing and recovering and re, re rebirthing i guess like this you know a, a birth of a new star just uh okay and you shed the light of the old stuff and that's wonderful you said it, you said it great thank you yeah yeah so Basically, what, what was given to me in that moment, like I was saying, is, yeah, uh, this new blueprint for how something can go, a new a new path. And so mm -hmm. instead of the old one of stress comes up, not allowed to express, need to shut down, that's the only thing left, it's now stress comes up and I can reach out for help if I need and I can express it. And I can, now that I'm an adult, it's not like a, I'm just in that four-year-old nervous system. Stress can kind of can come up, I can show up for myself and I can say, huh, what do I need? Should I go for a run? Should I do some yoga and stretch, stretch it out? Should I do some meditation and just kind of breathe through it? Should I call a friend and, you know, whine and complain to them a little bit about some stressful situation? And so, and then, you know, that's, that's also a bit of, you know, kind of what I'm talking about here is a bit of the integration and also how, an experience like writhing on psychedelics in your therapist's lap can actually translate to how I'm showing up for myself in the day-to-day -day in a new way. Yeah, very powerful. And it was a very good story. And it was a perfect way to kind of, you know, show in a story-like form and verbal form communication how that these, you know, how these ceremonies or how these sessions you know, and if, if you're doing an MDMA treatment or a ketamine one, that's three days, right? Is it three days always, or? Uh, it depends. So, I mean, MDMA is typically three sessions over months though. Over um, months. And then, okay. And then ketamine is like once a week, once every two weeks for, I mean, it depends. There's different protocols, but a, a general one to do the work we're kind of talking about is, um, you know, two to four a month uh, for anywhere from five to 15 sessions, depending on. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So you have one of those moments and now you know what that feels like. And now the next micro or macro trauma starts to pop up. And, you know, I, just, I think that when you're with somebody, a therapist specifically, man, can that be a huge game changer? Mm, yeah. Because now you, you have somebody with a, a toolkit that can be like, hey, use this. This is going to help you work through that. Use this. This is going to help you work through that. Uh, and again, I think the touch just to have a, 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 an affectionate connection with somebody, obviously all that has to get worked out beforehand, legalities, mm -hmm. insurance, I'm sure it can get really dicey, but I mean, it seems like this is what people are looking for. We're looking for that affirmation. We're looking for that connection. We're looking for tools to identify the traumas, neutralize them and move forward. And then let's talk a little bit about the integration part, because this is a piece, right? You talk about two to four sessions, um, a month. Is that what you said? Yeah, let me, yeah, go ahead. What were you saying? Yeah, two to four sessions a month. I was let me just interject something real quick though about what you were just saying with you know with touch and everything and one possibility. Um, because I, I think a lot we always say like um, you know, wounds that happen in relationship really need to be healed in relationship. And um touch is mm -hmm. just such a facilitator of things. I mean, you know, if if the experience is coming up is like being an infant, being a two-year-old, being a four-year-old, being a seven-year-old, even it's like what those, what those child, uh, children, child parts need is touch. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they don't need an adult sitting across the room from them being like, that, that feels hard. I mean, that's helpful too, but like they, they need that expressed through like a giant yes. ass hug and being enveloped. Yes. So how to manage that professionally? Um, one great thing, which isn't available to everyone, but in some cases is, and I've, um, you know, I've facilitated just really beautiful ketamine sessions with this is if someone's partner, has, if they have a really loving, sweet partner who is available. Um, and then, uh, then they're, you know, they're comfortable with touch with themselves and, um, and I can really remove myself. And when those moments come for them to be supported, I get to, you know, turn them toward their partner mm. and I can stay in a more easily stay in that just like professional role. So that yes. just want to throw that out there to people sure. as like one option. Um, but yeah, we can get into the integration. Sure, it's not always like, Kevin, I love you. Come here. I need to hold your head. <laughs> I'm sure that can be super intense from time to time. Jesus. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, that, that's, that's, a, you know, the way that you explained it was great, but let's talk about the integration part, mm -hmm. because if you're doing this, you know, uh, over an extended period of time, you take information from one therapy session and now you have to kind of like work on it. Okay. What was this thought? What was that thought? What was this feeling? What was this tool? And now you have to integrate it into your life, your day to day, basically, you know, reintegrate it or I don't want to use the word integrate again, but like you have to figure out a way to put it into your daily routine in order to make those changes last. Right. Mm hmm. So, I mean, how, how to do that? We, yeah. How else can we talk about how to do that? Yeah. 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 Good question. Because we have to go to our jobs. We got to take care of our kids. We got to like go back on our routine. Okay, honey, I did the psychedelic treatment on Saturday. Monday rolls around again. We got to take the kid to daycare. I got seven sessions I have to do. I got this work I got to do. You know, maybe you don't just jump right back into work and you slowly start to develop new ways of going about your day to day. But like, I'm sure it's individualized for everybody, but how let's maybe how, how about this question? How important is integration to the therapeutic process? In one of the ayahuasca circles I used to be in, we would always say integration is king. So, okay. Very, very integration very. is king. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. And otherwise it's just masturbation. <laughs> Beautiful. Enough said. <laughs> Um, what I really liked what you were pointing out was space. I think space is the, you know, um, one thing you were pointing out is that space isn't available for everyone, but that space can be really helpful. Um, I think that's just a great place to start is as best you can create space in your life, specifically, um, for the days after the experience, I did not do a great, I had like two days after this meditation retreat, I could have done better for myself. Um, so yeah. And, you know, to go back to the neural network thing, I think the space in life is what allows us to, yeah, it really mirrors what for, for me in my mind, I'm like what you're saying about the, the snow analogy, right? So it's like, if you have this wild experience on Sunday and then Monday, you're back at work. Well, Monday at work is that old brain with only the really dialed habituated slopes yes. to go down. Yes. But if you give yourself say a week then and there's just open space in that week, that's more akin to the fresh powder. Yes. Okay. Now I had this week. I just had this experience. Now I had this week to try something different. Yes. There's no real habits going on. Okay. Let me start doing some yoga classes or start working out or, you know, whatever it might be, start journaling, but there's space to go, go try things. Yes. Wonderful. And, and then when you get back into your life, there can, there can already be so, like slightly grooved new things hmm. and then it's like okay well i you know i just have been journaling and doing yoga and meditating every morning for the last week uh maybe i can 
work that into my life and, and do that three times a week now, or maybe I can at least do one of those things every morning. Yeah. And yeah, obviously like life comes back, et cetera. But I think that that's like one thing. And that's, you know, that's like a bit of a lifestyle change that we're talking about. Um, I think that's another thing is just that there's such a wide variety of what integration can look like from, I think, um, I know this people got in a little bit of trouble with the consciousness medicine book um, really, I think does a great job of laying out integration and the different types of integration. Who wrote it? Um, Francois and her last name starts with the B and it's called consciousness medicine book. Uh, it's called conscious is medicine. Yeah. Oh, conscious is medicine. Got it. No, no is just consciousness oh. medicine. Oh, consciousness medicine. Sorry. Yeah. Very good. And it's, yeah, it's about, um, but yeah, I, I will say they, uh, I think they did get in some trouble. So just look out for that. If you okay. happen to come across that, Yeah. but, um, sure. the, the materials really solid. Um, yeah, they talk about like you know, so with integrations, like on the physical level, spiritual level, emotional level, mental level, lifestyle, like we we're talking about. So there, there's all these different possibilities of how to explore it. And, you know, something like starting to meditate, that could be a bit of, that's like some spiritual integration for you and some lifestyle things, you're introducing a new habit. And maybe that touches also mental, emotional for you. So, um, just to say there's like these different avenues to explore and depending on the person and depending on the experience that they had, they might feel called to, um, tackle integration in, in one of those realms more, more than another. Very interesting. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. We've been chatting for like an hour and 20, an hour and. Yeah, I don't even know. I can't do the math real quickly. But uh, yeah, we've been chatting for a while. Um, you got a quick. You got you got more time, or are you done? You gotta be done. Yeah, I can go. I can go like another ten or twenty minutes. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, let, I I just got a couple more questions. Um, right. what are like? How are you connected with Doctor Dan Engel? Are you guys doing any work together, or how does that how's that going? Yes, yeah, so that's thank you life. What I'm repping here. Um, this is a nonprofit that we started last year. Uh, last year was really our formation year and it is a psychedelic therapy fund. Um, and so at the moment, because ketamine is the only federally legal thing, we're only working with ketamine. What we do is give grants to people who can't afford psychedelic work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if, if somebody wants to get a ketamine series and thinks that will be really beneficial for them. And they go to some uh, clinic and find out it's not affordable. Um, then they can, um, well, ultimately we'll have an application up where people can apply. Um, we're looking to put a hundred thousand dollars through our fund this year. I think that'll That'll be a good amount of people. I imagine that will be um, 50 to 100 people that we'll be able to serve if we do all of that. Um, and so right now lists? we have... Like, are there waiting lists for people to try psychedelics and do therapy like this that can't? Yeah, so we, we have a small waiting list, but we haven't really opened this up to the public too much yet. We're launching more in March, but there's... I mean, there's just such a great need that... Uh, we have a we have a provider network of about 20 25 um clinics all over the US and so the first round of us opening it up is just letting the clinics know hey when you have someone that comes to you who can't afford it come let us know and we can give them a grant i think we'll get through the 100k just through that method easily um but yeah, we're like, we're looking for big donors because we, you know, I want to put a hundred million dollars to this fund and it's going to take time to build, but the, you know, the need is there and the need is tremendous and access is a huge issue. And that's, that's really what we're doing. Um, that's the core of our mission is access for all. Uh, because right now it's great that it's here and it's great that it's 
at a way different place than it's been in the last many decades. And um, it's known as like a white and wealthy movement. And um, it's a start, but it also needs to change. And so a lot of the, um, the specific like uh, populations that we're going to focus on is people of color, the LGBT community, and also veterans. Mm. Um, and, you know, the core of all that is going to be the, the, the financial piece, but the, those are like the three communities that we really want to support and typically don't have a ton of access to this sort yeah. of work. Yeah, no, this is God's work. This is straight God's work. Like I, mm. when I became a high school teacher, I taught all around the city, Chicago, South side, West side, uh, mm. suburbs. And, you know, there's a completely different population of kids in like just a 60 mile radius. You know what mm. I'm saying? More fortunate than others, less fortunate than others. And I got to understand and, and be in the middle of these different communities and just like, you know, ponder life and purpose and you know why you grew up where you did and how you got your parents and like just this whole thing that life is and it's interesting how different you know different areas of just one city are based on just you know finances or culture and how societies run and it's just I'm, I'm fascinated with how life works and how groups of people work together and some parts are in real like dire need of help in a lot of ways in a lot of forms and when people start realizing how powerful th psychedelic therapy can be or just like holistic therapy in general i like to talk about meditation exercise obviously fasting uh just different types of breathing exercises fascial maneuvers like uh you know, different diet protocols anti-inflammatory foods um hot cold therapy cold plunges and, and sauna oh, yeah. use right like all these things that you can do physically to enhance some of your nervous system states right or just become more aware of your thoughts teaching people about not being judgmental with their you know just their self-reflection uh you're doing the work of god really like you're helping people in so many different areas that uh you know don't have access and i love that mission i'm drawn to it really mm, uh, super mm -hmm. fortunate to meet you randomly at Zecker Park, you know, and just kind of, you know, run through all these topics today with you and just kind of get a deeper understanding. Like you said so many things today that made me go, Oh yeah. Interesting. I didn't look at it. Like the infant needs to borrow mom's and dad's nervous system. Like my wife and I just have a baby. He's four, four and a half months mm. old. And Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Now I look at it like that. Like, Oh, he obviously needs to borrow our nervous systems. Like, Thank God, yes. you know, I'm understanding so much more of the human body as I go through my career, because as a father now, like just being in, in the pregnancy stage the last you know year, it was like calm the way the way we communicate our boundaries are how do we how are we requesting what we need and in which manner we're doing this together. How much is the baby taking on? So I was like trying to be as aware as possible of all these aspects to have the smoothest birth process and now just like to teach the kid about life from, you know, the most optimal standpoint. Um, and you know, it just like, and life goes on, you know, you just have more kids and the kids have kids and you want to pass down this knowledge. And I think here we're embarking on something very, very powerful and profound that the world needs more now than ever. You know, we have so much technology, we have access to so much stuff. Um, but a lot of folks are confused today in the social media age. Algorithms are basing their what their their feed is, and uh, people are going to have a hard time discerning what's real and what's not real. And I think holistic medicine techniques, I think uh, psychedelic therapies, I think you know regular therapy is so important just to untangle some of the chatter here. Because I also think no matter how healthy you are. And how aware you are, we always have these regressions and we'll have something traumatic mm -hmm. happen where we have to go through the process again and again and again, no matter how healthy and, you know, how deep you understand consciousness and all that, we still will revert back to some of our old tendencies. This is just the way reality works. 
and uh, just to constantly being aware. And this is a, this is a game. This is a thing that we have to work on daily. So, um, dude, thanks so much for your time today. Where can people find your organization where people can find you? And if you have any last closing thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to say we, um, if you feel inspired to, uh, support us in any way, please go to thinkylife.org slash donate. And, um, yeah, we, we need all the help that we can get to really get this mission, um, running and thriving. And I'll also say you can email me personally at Kevin at thank you If, uh, you're, you want to get involved in some sort of way. And if you, um, yeah, maybe you want to give a big gift, but want to know a little bit more about what we, what we do and, and who we are. And we'd be so happy to, to meet with you and, and share with you a bit about that. Um, we're, we also have, um, an Instagram thank you life fund. Uh, there's an underscore in there somewhere, but I, if, if you type in thank you life fund, you'll, you'll find us, um, you can follow us on there. We'll be coming out with some things over the next couple of months. We're going to be launching here in like March, April, uh, doing a little bit of a public launch. So you can look out for some of those things. And um, yeah, right now we're really just looking for people to jump on our bandwagon and, um, and really get behind what we do. And, you know, you're one of those people. So thank you so much oh, for yeah. having me today and for uh, yeah, believing in the mission and also just being interested to talk about these uh, really rich subjects. Yeah. I, I, it's my pleasure, dude. You're the man. And um, yeah, I want to learn as much as possible. This is a very, it's a hard topic to explain to, to folks, you know, going back to that Bill Hicks quote and I'll, I'll read it again just to close it mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause I was very like, wow, this is a good one. Um, today, a young man on acid realized that all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration, that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream and we are the imagination of ourselves. Hey, Tom, what's the weather like? You know, it's just like, uh, so deep that people are just like, all right, well, what are you going to do with that piece of information? <laughs> and it's just like, all right. But uh, I think here we talked a lot of like the practical sides of all this and how we can work on ourselves through our traumas or my micro macro traumas, some of the tools that we talk about here on healing and integration is king. I love that phrase. I think mm, that's huge. Yeah. I'm very, uh, I very, uh, I very much vibe with that. And yeah, dude, I, I, I'm going to keep using you as a resource. And if I have more questions uh, about this kind of stuff, I'm definitely going to reach out and, yeah, I think you did a great job of sharing your stories today. I, I know I can ramble on such things, but uh, I really appreciate your time and uh, yeah, sharing your stories and your your genuine nature. It's great. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. This is a blast. And um, dude, come down to Austin again soon. Dude, hell yeah. It's, it's on my list, well, you know, for sure. All right, brother. I don't know how easy that will be with a kid, but. You know, we're trying to find ways to travel. We took him to Miami last uh, last month, and that was fun. But when you're on a trip with a baby, it's not really like a trip for you. It's like everything has to be attended to the baby. We're just not going to bars. We went down to Miami South Beach, and we went to one bar. But like at 12, you know, 1 p.m., we had some lunch. We had a drink and then walking around, you know. So, but yeah, it's, it's definitely on my list of things to do. I, I have a long time to live here. And I have a lot of things that I want to do. And there's a lot of people that I want to meet and see and really just mysteries I want to unlock about consciousness and uh, how we can self-actualize and self-heal. I, I really believe and my gym's mission is that we are self-healing organisms and mm. um, we're trying to optimally connect to our physical, our mental, our emotional and our spiritual. Uh, and we're doing that through fitness and we're doing that through holistic protocols really um and i think this is just another avenue of diving deeper into the landscape that is consciousness and uh other ways that we can self-heal so thanks again kevin you're the freaking man have a wonderful day and god bless you you're doing god's work mm, thanks brother take care